fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high silver, the Lone Ranger. With his faithful Indian companion, Tonto, the daring and resourceful masked rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. One, Silver! Let's go, big fellow! I am Silver! The Lone Ranger and Tonto had watered their horses in the wooded stream and were ready to continue on their journey. Tonto, there are those bloodhounds again. They seem to be heading in this direction. Ah, if prisoners escape, them come this way, maybe. Yes, they would head for the woods. Still, how long can they remain at large, I wonder? Not long, Kimasabi. Too many guards. Quiet. Quiet, Tonto. In the reeds. There. Ah, let me see him, Kimasabi. All right, you in the water, hiding in the reeds. No use, we see you. Come out of there. He must have him escape prison, I'm sure. Yes. Put down your guns. I, I give up. I, I couldn't breathe anymore. Hey, uh, you, you, you're not God, you're masked. But on the side of the law, I'm going to turn you in. No, you can't. You can't turn me in, please. Don't send me back to prison, not now. I'll go back, sure, I'll go back, but first... First, go to... you want to return to Kierville and get revenge on Jim Keppel. Your name is Fred Tracy. You were in jail for killing your uncle, Mike Fahey. That's right. Except that I didn't kill my uncle. And I don't want revenge if you mean killing Jim Keppel. And how did you know who I was? I recognize you. Your father was a friend of mine, Tracy. A good friend. I never thought I'd see the day when his son would go to prison for murder. I tell you, I didn't kill my uncle. I was framed by Jim Keppel. It's true. I think he couldn't even prove my uncle was dead. The evidence was planted. That's an old cry of people who get caught. I'm telling you the truth. I swear it. And why haven't you appealed your case? You've been in prison for more than a year. Yes. But it's useless trying to fight from there. You hurt yourself by making escape. Why you run away now? Because tomorrow I have one last chance to clear myself. How, I don't know. But I do know I want to keep Jim Keppel from taking every bit of property left by my Uncle Mike. He can do that? Yes. I've learned he's going to appear in court tomorrow. To present papers that'll give my uncle's entire estate to him if they're accepted. I see. You want the estate. I don't. I don't want a penny of it. Whatever the papers are, though, they're fake. They'd have to be. Do you have anything to prove what you say? Nothing. Only my story and the knowledge that I'm innocent. Listen to those bloodhounds. They're getting nearer. Even if you were to prove your innocence, you'd have to go back to prison. You know that. Of course I do. I want to be free only long enough to do whatever I can. 
If I'm successful, I'll go back to prison knowing they'll let me out soon. If I'm not successful, then... Well, anything after that doesn't matter. I'd like to hear your story, Tracy. It's too long. The guards will be here before I finish. Yes, I realize that. I realize that if you are innocent, I owe it to your father to try and prove it. You mean you... you'll help me? For one day, you've escaped from prison and are going back. I don't imagine it matters whether you're away one day or not. Dogs, guards, plenty near Kimosabi. Yes, I know, Toto. We'll have to get away from here at once and use all the back trails we know. Ah, we need good start. An Easter up ground, Kimosabi. High trail, maybe. Yes, do that, Toto. Get on my horse, Tracy, right. while Tonto tries to get rid of your trail around here. I'll never be able to thank you for this. I don't want you to. When we get to my camp near Kierville, I just want you to tell me the complete story of why you were sent to prison. The Lone Ranger, Tonto, and Fred Tracy had arrived at a secluded spot on the outskirts of Kierville late that evening. Their journey had been without incident, and Tonto was now arranging the tent. Me fix bed with plenty cover. You sleep while we gone. But first, Tracy, I want your story. You know some of it, I believe. I know that your uncle, Mike Fahey, and Jim Keppel were partners in various enterprises. That's right. And I worked for them as sort of manager, bookkeeper, and general everything. I see. One thing Uncle Mike didn't know was that Jim Keppel owned the White Yucca Cafe. He wasn't a partner in that. Is that important? No, except that the cafe was used as sort of a private headquarters by Keppel and the many associated with away from business. I see. Now, what I know of the case is mere hearsay. But as I understand it, your uncle went to Frontier Town to get a large sum of cash from the bank there. Yes. That was a little more than a year ago. Huh? Uncle Mike and Keppel used the Frontier Town Bank for all their big transactions. They got tent all fixed now. Good, Toto. Go on, Tracy. Well, and... On that particular morning, I was the one who was supposed to go to Frontier Town and pick up the money. Supposed to? You didn't go? No. At the last minute, Keppel said my uncle was going. He sent me out to his ranch, it's just a few miles from here, and gave me some instructions for Chad Derrigan. Yes, I've heard of him. He's Keppel's sidekick, isn't he? Yes, and was long before Keppel and Uncle Mike joined up. Anyway, at that time, Berrigan was running Keppel's Ranch. Well, something happened at Ranch when you go there? Nothing. The place was deserted and no sign of Berrigan around. Yet at the trial, Berrigan testified he'd been there all the time and produced witnesses who swore they'd been there with him. And Keppel swore he'd never sent me on the errand. Well, you tell the truth. That frame of... It is the truth. I tried to convince the judge and jury, but they didn't believe my story. Your uncle was gone when you got back to Kierville? Yes, he, he'd gone to Frontier Town. Oh. It's been proved he picked up the money at the bank and headed back for Kierville. But no one ever saw him after that. And find no trace of him, huh? Not to this day. They take it for granted he's dead, but there's nothing to prove it. Didn't they find part of the money from the Frontier Town Bank among your belongings? Part of it, yes, a very small part. And there was blood on it, too. Uncle Mike's blood, they said. It was Keppel who suggested the search. Yet what they found was enough to convict you. On a trumped-up robbery charge. The jury wanted to convict me of murder, using Keppel's and Berrigan's testimony as a basis. There was no body, though. That's what the judge told them. Not a trace of the body. So he dropped their proposal and made the robbery sentence as stiff as he could. I see. Tracy, what do you know of this paper Keppel is going to produce in court tomorrow? I've been told it's supposed to be an agreement signed by both Uncle Mike and Keppel. In it, one agrees that his complete possessions be turned over to the other in the event he dies or, or deserts the business for a year. Something like that, anyway. It's very bad, isn't it? Now, look, Tracy. On the day your uncle disappeared, whatever happened, would have had to take place between here and Frontier Town, right? I think so. But you'll never find clues after a year. And if you did find the body after all this time... I, I don't want to think of it. Identification would be the important thing. How would you identify your uncle, forgetting his physical setup? Well, his clothes, for one thing. He always wore complete black outfits with a gray Stetson. Oh? And then, well, the most outstanding thing was the beaded belt. A beautiful, elaborate belt given him by Chief Manawanta. Chief Manawanta? Me know him. One he prized so much, he always wore it. Uh, come here, Toto. Oh, you must have Tracy, look at Tonto's belt, will you? All right. Uh, get near the fire, Tonto. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's it. Now, Tracy, was your uncle's belt anything like that? 
yes. I didn't think there was another. Yes, like that, except that, well, his name was on the belt. Not in beads. It seems as if the beads had been left off where the name was written. You could do that to your belt, couldn't you, Toto? Ah, okay, Miss Harvey. Take a few hours, maybe, but me do it. What are you going to do, stranger? I'm not quite sure yet. Maybe there's a way of making Keppel break so that he'll expose himself. We'll see. Well, we'll get going to Kierville, Toto. If Keppel's not at the White Yucca Cafe, he'll be at his range, most likely. It'll be late when you get to Kierville. We'll make it by midnight. But before we visit Keppel, I think we'll see the sheriff first. Keppel can wait. Jim Keppel was waiting in his office at the White Yucca, playing solitaire and occasionally looking through the open door into the crowded room outside. He'd been playing listlessly most of the evening when suddenly he looked up and saw his right-hand man, Chad Berrigan, pushing his way recklessly through the customers, heading directly to the office. Now what's eating Chad? Hey, Kip, I gotta see you alone, Kip. Hey, what's the excitement, Chad? Hey, Kip, Kip, Tracy's escaped. Is that in a level? When did it happen? He broke prison this morning. I just heard it at the sheriff's office. They're getting a posse together. They think he's heading this way. How do they know? Just guessing, I imagine. They say he's coming back after you. Yeah? <laughs> Be a good excuse to wipe him out if he does show up, wouldn't it? Cap, you think maybe he learned something? About what? About tomorrow, maybe. Suppose he heard you were going to court to claim my fate. <laughs> Suppose? Yeah, there's no supposing about it. He knows. What? You heard me. If he stayed in jail, he'd know it in a couple of days. And go on living. It happens he knew it a couple of days ahead and he didn't stay in jail. He's still living, maybe, but... You mean you wanted him to break out? I wasn't sure he'd try, but it's what I wanted. No matter where he is now, he's a clay pigeon. We couldn't get him hanged a year ago. So we, uh... He'll get himself shot now. Here or somewhere else. It works out all around, see? It was nearing midnight, and Sheriff Wirt Campion was about to close his office for the evening. Then he saw a shadow flip past his front window. Without hesitating a moment, he rushed to the door and jerked it open, gun in hand. All right, you, up with your hands. One move towards your gun, and that's it. Now step inside here. Well, an Indian. Sneaking around outside, huh? Well, we'll soon find out why. Me tell you why. Shut up and turn around. Thank you, Sheriff. What the... Suppose you turn around and face me. That's the way. I think he's gotten out. Ah, he got a mask man together, eh? A trick. Yes, a trick, Sheriff. But it worked well, didn't it? What do you want? Whatever it is, you won't get it. My posse Your will get posse is you. out searching for Fred Tracy. How do you know that? Because I happen to have Fred Tracy. You, you have? Say, what is this? A trade, if you'll listen, Sheriff. I'll trade you Fred Tracy for 12 hours. Now you're talking nonsense. What do you mean? Just what I said. I can produce Tracy if you'll cooperate with me in the cause of justice. I won't cooperate with you in anything. You're nothing but... Say, what is that you've got in your hand there? You're a friend of Sheriff Taylor's, aren't you? In Frontier Town? That's got nothing to do... Thank golly, that's a silver bullet. Sure, I'm a friend of Sheriff Taylor's, and he's told me, but... A masked man and an Indian. By golly, you must be... That's right. Then if you tell me you want cooperation in the cause of justice, by golly, you'll get it. And I know you'll turn over Fred Tracy, like you said. Hey, golly, think of meeting you. Here, now, put down that gun and let's talk. Come on, come on in. What is it you want me to do? Just a few things. The first center's around Jim Keppel. But I want you to understand that I have no way of... The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger story. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments.
continue our story. It was after midnight when Jim Keppel and Chad Berrigan finished another conference at Keppel's ranch house. Keppel looked with pride at the papers he would present in court in the morning. Ah, this is a nice job, Chad. Great. <laughs> right down to that fake notary signature. <laughs> Good thing the case comes up before Kingsley and... Hey, what's that? It was at the window. Someone rapping? Sounded like that. I'll see who it is. If there was anybody there. Oh, that's the door. Someone's there. I've got it covered, Chad. Come on in. I said, come on in. Hey, what is this? Get over and open that door, Chad. I'll get the door. Get your head. Chad, there's no one here. Hey, the window again. Leave that door and come on over here, Chad. Somebody's being wise. Yeah, it looks that way. I'll open the window. Hey, the door again. No, you don't. Pop it. Someone shut that door, Chad, on the outside. I can't see anyone near the window, Cap. It's a trick. I'll keep the window covered. You go outside and see who's around. Be careful now, Chad. I'll watch out. Something's funny here. You wait there, Cap. I'll go around the side and look. While Jim Keppel faced the window, his gun pointing at the opening, Chad Berrigan hurried out the front door, gun in hand, and walked into the night. He peered about him in the inky darkness and saw no one. Then he turned a corner. Don't move another inch, Berrigan. You're covered. Hey, who are you? Where'd you come from? Never mind. Turn around and start walking again. I've got your horse ready for you. You're taking a little ride to Kierville. Why, Keep you... going. While Jim Keppel watched the window in his ranch house, his gun arm tensed, his whole being alert, the Lone Ranger and Tonto rode back to Kierville with the reluctant Chad Berrigan between them. It was shortly before dawn when the masked man and Tonto appeared once more, where the sheriff had been waiting most of the night in his office. Sheriff, we have Berrigan tied up. He's out in your stable. That all right with you? Oh, I'm afraid this is all too high-handed. I'm using my office to... To find the truth. Just wait till this is over, Sheriff. Now, that window tapping and door pounding nonsense didn't work on Keppel, did it? <laughs> I'll bet he's back there fighting with phantoms right now. Yeah, he's on edge. And unless I miss my guess, he'll take off when dawn breaks and ride here. He'll want your protection in case Fred Tracy should be around. Uh, Sheriff, you look at Belt now. Uh, what do you think, huh? Well, I'll be doggone. It looks just like Mike Fahey's. Good. And the rest depends on how we use it. Yep. And if Jim Keppel will take to the bait. That's our one hope. Meanwhile, Tonto and I'll take Berrigan out a bit on the frontier town road and get ready for our entrance. We'll keep an eye on Keppel, Sheriff. Tonto, cut those ropes on Berrigan. Remove that gag from his mouth. Thanks, Toto. All right, come along, Berrigan. We're taking you on another ride. What are you trying to do? Where are we going? Just a short distance down the frontier town road this time. So we can ride back as if we'd been someplace. Where's that? Don't ask questions. Just do as you're told. Here, take this belt, Berrigan. Hey, what? Oh, you... you look startled. It does look like Mike Fahey's belt, doesn't it? The Lone Ranger had guessed rightly. Jim Keppel, perturbed by Berrigan's disappearance and fearful of Tracy's presence, waited till dawn before taking off. Sheriff Wirt Campion was waiting in his office when he heard Keppel ride up outside. When Keppel opened the door and entered, Campion chuckled. <laughs> Hi, Keppel. Court doesn't open for quite a spell. Sort of expected you, though. Expected me? Why? Uh, you wouldn't know why. Hmm? Got something on your mind, haven't you? Huh? What are you trying to get at, Campion? The truth about Fred Tracy, for one thing. I hear he escaped. They got him yet? Oh, forget about that part. You go to court this morning to try and collect Mike Fahey's money, don't you? What's that got to do with Tracy? I might know the answer to that in a minute. 
And it might mean a lot, depending on what those horsemen outside picked up. Hey, excuse me, Uncle Kepel. I want to see them before they come barging in here. I'll be back in a minute. Hey, Chad Bergen's with them. Ain't the man now. As Sheriff Campion bustled out the door, Jim Keppel, suspicious and ill at ease, tried to understand the sheriff's allusions. He walked to the window and saw a sight that made the blood drain from his face. The sheriff told the truth. Berrigan was outside, astride a horse and sitting afraid-like between a masked man and an Indian. What was that Berrigan was handing to Sheriff Campion? It looked like... But no, that couldn't be. Mike Faye's belt? No! He had no time to debate the question with himself. As the three horsemen took off again, Keppel hurried to the center of the room. Sheriff Campion entered. I just learned a lot of things, Keppel. Yes, sir. Like to have a look at this belt? Eh? Why, why should I? I thought you might find it interesting. Now just take a look at this belt, will you? Strangest belt I ever did see. Exactly like the one Mike Fay used to wear. The room began to spin around as Keppel eyed the beaded belt the sheriff placed on the desk. A beautiful belt indeed. The like of which he had seen only once before. And yes, there was the name worked into it. Mike Fay. This was a trap. Did Campion think he, Keppel, would react to it? Did Berrigan reveal the truth? Or... He mustn't show the panic he felt. He had to be cool in the spotlight. Where do we find out where he got it and how he knew where it was? Mighty interesting to know. Where are you going, Keppel? I thought you came to see me. Uh, I've changed my mind, Campion. See you in court later. Yeah, I reckon you will. I want to talk to you more about this belt next time. After all, Faye was your partner and... Uh, Well, well. Outside the sheriff's office, Jim Keppel walked slowly to give an air of composure just in case Campion was watching him from the window. But he walked slowly more because his legs were wobbly, as was his mind. Nearing his horse and with no one in sight, he talked to himself. But Chad wouldn't squeal. Why should he? Maybe Tracy's come back with some information. No, that's foolish. Where would he get it? That beaded belt with Faye's name. He must have found the body, sure enough. Why did Campion let me walk out if they did? He was acting funny and smart-like. Maybe he's just playing a cat-and-mouse game. I wonder... I better ride away from here, Prado. Here I am, Bullet. Steady now. Yeah, that's it. All right, get up, Bullet. And what'll I do? Wonder what Campion expect me to do when I saw those clothes in that belt. Break down? Uh, something like that, I bet. Sure. Those clothes weren't phased the bell either. Everybody knows he wore things like that. It's just a plan to make me talk before I go to court today. Tracy might... Oh, what am I talking about? If they found the body, I'd better get out of here in a hurry. If they didn't, I can out-bluff them. <laughs> uh, I better make sure. Yeah, I've got to. I'm going to see if that body's still there. Get up, bullet. Come on, get up. Jim Keppel made his way to the cave where Mike Fahey's body had been left more than a year ago. A cave deep in the hills and hidden from view. He made his way stealthily so that no one could see, hear, or follow him. And if they did, well, they hadn't. He was in the far reaches now, walking steadily, his heart beating louder than the steps that seemed to echo around him from all sides. And now he was at the turn that would give him the answer he sought. He closed his eyes for a moment, then opened them as perspiration fell from his brow. Now if... Ha! Ah, it's here. That body's still here. They didn't find it. The body or the rest of the money. Ha! <laughs> they didn't find the body. They have now, Kevin. Now... 
No, they'll never find your body either. Too slow, Kevin. Too slow mentally, too. Didn't know you were followed. Let yourself be fooled by the belt we fixed for you. My shoulder. I... That's only a wound, Keppel. It's going to be much worse than that. I'll take you right on to Sheriff Campion's office. Otto should have arrived there with Fred Tracy by now. Judge Kingsley entered his courtroom and looked with amazement at the crowd assembled before the bench. And in the spectator's seats. Do I see rightly, or is that a man in a mask back there? Your Honor, he just brought in these men I have before you. Sheriff, who are they? Now, look, according to my calendar, the first case is that of Jim Keppel and the estate of Michael Fee. Well, that's half right, Judge. Only it's the state asking an indictment against Jim Keppel for the murder of Michael Fahey and the appropriation of his estate in part. And also the state against Chad Barrick and this other man for aiding and abetting Keppel. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is too much. This other man. What in heaven's name is... Why, he's wearing a convict's uh, uniform. For only a few days more, Your Honor. You'll take the steps to right the wrong that's been done him. That's Fred Tracy, and now, he... Now, say here, Sheriff. You're acting as prosecutor, grand jury, defense attorney, advisor to the court, and, and general confuser. Now, let's start at the beginning. The first question I asked was about that mask man back there. Well, say, where is he? Hey, he's done his job, Your Honor. He's gone. Done his job? What nonsense is this? Job? Now, look, Sheriff. Who is he? Uh, didn't you recognize him, Your Honor? That was the Lone Ranger. I was still, uh, oh. George W. Trendle production, directed by Charles D. Livingston, edited by Fran Stryker, and the part of the Lone Ranger is played by Brace Beamer. <laughs>